Thank you very much indeed. Wonderful to be here uh, with two such talented uh, authors, Sid and Guy, and I heartily commend their books. And I think there's going to be a signing afterwards, as you said. Dash out. Don't just buy one copy. Buy several for members of the family as well. Um, this, and crikey, I can't ask for better weather for this subject. We're all sort of melting slightly. So uh, perhaps if you feel like blowing towards the stage just to help keep us cool, that would be hugely appreciated. Um, the thing that really springs to mind is um, we had a meeting in the Science Museum last year with the Natural History Museum where we pondered the two separate COP processes. And everyone knows about COP27 and COP28, but there's also a biodiversity one. So the COP27-28 focused on cutting carbon, but the biodiversity one was COP15. And it became really clear that the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis are really two sides of the same coin. Um, and so I suppose the first thing I want to ask both of you is, um, you know, Sid, you're looking at how we should rethink our relationship with nature. And Guy, you're looking at how humans should respond to the climate crisis. Um, but what do we mean by nature? And do we actually include humans? Are humans part of nature? Or are we separate from nature? Because if it's the latter, is that helpful? That's what I'm really asking. So, Guy, do you want to have a go first? Yeah, hello. Hello, and thanks, uh, thanks for coming on this very, very, uh, very hot day when I'm sure you've got many <laughs> nice, cooler places to be. So, so I think we really appreciate that. Um, yes, are humans part of nature? Well, yes, of course, we're part of nature. But what we have done is become this dominant species where we have changed the planet. We've changed um, the geology, the climate the um, ocean circulation, um, how and where rivers flow, and of course, we've changed biodiversity. You know, we've created enormous numbers of artificial animals and artificial plants. You know, most of the, uh, some more than 90% of uh, the uh, animals on Earth are actually creatures that we've created through breeding to feed and serve us. You know, many of the, uh, the original species that they were based on, like, uh, don't exist anymore. You know, the auric went um, extinct uh, in the 1500s in, in, in Britain, certainly, um, and, and elsewhere. So that puts us in a particular place of responsibility, I think, over the natural world. Um, not least because we're still incredibly dependent on on the natural world and on ecology because uh, there you know much as much as uh, certain uh, entrepreneurs in America might might say that we can always you know terraform Mars or something the reality is we are extremely dependent on um, on the natural world and we are pushing it pushing it into this towards the sixth uh, mass extinction but also pushing it out of um, a position where it becomes habitable for humans you know much of nature will carry on if we just suddenly went extinct but we certainly with these huge populations and with these civilizations these interconnected civilizations that we've created are highly highly dependent on the natural world but we don't see it because we live in cities Sid what's your take on it so there's this, um, there's this framework buried in a report by the IPBES. You don't have to know what that is. Um, where they say there's, there's ways of thinking about our relationship with nature as living from nature, living in nature, living with nature, and living as nature. And I think that's true to all of those things. I mean, on, on the most basic level, we live from nature. We take things from nature so we can exist. Um, and we also live in nature. I mean, even cities, I think, we forget that they are at the end of the day, human-made ecosystems. You know, I've been you know, sneezing all day because I've got hay fever. There are, there, there are plants all around us. There are, this is a living system at the end of the day, even if we've terraformed it. Um, but the, the, the final two, I think, are more interesting. So there's this idea of living with nature, living in harmony with nature, living um, in a way that supports the rest of nature, including us. And then there's a kind of deeper spiritual um, relationship to nature that's living as nature. So lots of indigenous cultures point to that first and say that's the most obvious thing, and then kind of all the rest of it follows. So it really depends on where you start. We typically start in living from nature. What can we take from it? But you could just as easily start on the other end and say, of course we're nature. We just have a different you know, set of tools at our disposal to you know, all the other ecosystem engineers. So we, 
you know, we're now heading towards the next two COP meetings. Um, we've got COP28 in Dubai. Again, that's the one focused on cutting carbon and climate change. And then we've got COP16, which is going to be held uh, next year in Turkey. Um, do you think it's right? I mean, I mean, let's face it, the COP process is a sclerotic, arthritic, glacially slow process. I mean, I went to a big climate change meeting in Toronto in 88. They weren't even called COPs then. And the narrative was exactly the same as the narratives we've got today, and still we're waiting for action to happen. So do you think there's a, should we have two separate COP processes, or should we join these arthritic processes and just have one, just to acknowledge the role of nature in climate change and controlling it? So, I mean, if you go back to the history of how these things began, they began at the Rio Earth Summit, um, which was, you know, 25 years ago at this point, I think. Um, and they were one process at the beginning. And you know, in the book, I have this amazing quote by a speaker on the floor who says, um, you talk too much about survival, you don't talk enough about life, when the possibilities for uh, life end, the possibilities for survival begin. And there are peoples here in the Amazon who still live, who don't want to reach down to the level of survival. That was a plea in Rio in 1992 to say, can we keep these processes the same and not split them up? But what we ended up with is you know, two parallel tracks in some ways for good reason. I think the, the, the biodiversity crisis and all of us who work on it have a lot to learn from the climate crisis and some of the work that's been done there where it really has gone from this niche process that you know, negotiators and some academics turn up to to this huge thing that makes headlines every year. Biodiversity cops don't do that. And I think part of that is a science communication issue. So the work of you know, Gaia and yourself, I mean, this is really important work. So in some ways, I'm happy now that there are two cops. It's just we need the profile of the biodiversity cop to be significantly higher, because uh, the climate cop does a great job of every year, like clockwork, you get a report. You know, and typically, it's well-timed, because there's something burning or something flooding. It's happening all the time now, so you can make the links. And you know, the media can be a really helpful way of catalyzing yeah. this. So I don't know what you think, Guy. Yeah, Guy, what I do you mean, think? One yeah. cop process or two? No, um, I mean, I would say more. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah i mean absolutely it has you know the cop is not it has not been amazingly successful but but you know as you said it is it has been it has transformed over the last 20 years and um there is a call for um instead of it being every two years that they bring out the uh, assessments that bring them out um, annually and we are getting a remarkable process even though it's very slow we're getting incredible progress you know this this idea this this commitment in 2015 um, in Paris to to keep below 20 to keep below two degrees above pre-industrial average and um, aim to keep below 1.5. I mean, you know, I don't think we're going to do that, but still, the intention that was there and that um, it and people signing up to it makes it legally, um, you know, makes it a, a legally binding thing in, in um, home nations. And now we're getting the start of uh, climate litigation, which is really exciting. Um, and of course, they're intertwined. Of course, the biodiversity crisis is intertwined. But it's also an enormous, complex um, system on its own. And it needs that dedication. Social justice, another global issue which um, could do with its own COP. How do we, how do we work out, you know, human labor and capital how do we how do we manage that water what about water we need a water cop and then maybe <laughs> as i this as, is as a i call for, as i call here. for more cops you know <laughs> then then maybe there needs to be um, some sort of process which which acknowledges the knitting together of this and and that needs to be a strategic thing um, with with uh, diplomats and um, experts right. working but i mean you know you i'm just one last thing you know, when we talk about the slow progress of COP, because all of these things are intertwined, and in the COP, um, there is an acknowledgement of the role of nature, and in the biodiversity, there is a massive re response of the role of, um, of climate, and, you know, water is all in that, and social justice. The last COP 
there was an acknowledgement that rich countries should pay poor countries for the losses and damages incurred by climate change. And I don't think people appreciate just how revolutionary as a concept that is. As there were a lot of details to work out, though. And of that, course the there are. And you can details. be super yeah. cynical, but you can also say... Yeah. This is an unbelievable process. Um, you know, we have made progress on, on a global scale with countries that are at war with each other. You know, we have more than 50 conflicts going on right now around the world. And yet, these bind us together and social injustice with it is binding, is, is, is part of this process. And I think, I think that's really, that should be uh, celebrated. And what about Sid's point that actually, you know, you talked about the Paris targets. That's a very easy way to articulate what we've got to do. You know, we're aiming for that one and a half degrees, maybe two degrees climate change. But somehow with biodiversity, we haven't come up with a simple way to frame it. And, and you know, we're, we're in the UK, which is, I think, the G7's least biodiverse country. We talk about a green and pleasant land, but it's actually a biodiversity desert, this country. We've wiped out so many species and things. It's well, a we monoculture. we had 30 by 30, didn't we? When was that? I mean, so that Earlier this year, was it? So, you know, do, I mean, do you, do you, how far do you think we need to go to actually get people to appreciate just how serious the biodiversity crisis is, even in the UK? Yes, I mean, so as Gaia said, there is this target to say, let's conserve 30% of the world's land surface and oceans by 2030. It's called a 30 by 30 initiative. And on one, one level, it's really good. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a target. I think about 17% today is conserved on land. We're closer on the oceans. But it really traps us in the paradigm that we've been trapped in for the last 100 plus years on nature, where we say, what we need to do with nature is fence it off, set it apart from human society, do whatever we want with the other 70%, and as long as we preserve the 30%, we're on track. I, then nothing could be further from the truth than that, because human society depends on healthy ecosystems, not on the 30%, but across the whole 100%. So I think in some ways, it's an eye-catching target, and it would be a good thing to get 30% of our ecosystems under some form of protection, but it's, nowhere, it's nothing like the 1.5 degrees, right? Because it, it fundamentally traps us, it just traps us in that world of setting nature aside and having no real kind of economic value from nature Whereas with climate, we've done this amazing thing. We now have climate technologies, climate companies, careers in climate. So people don't, I mean, 20 years ago, people used to say, oh, someone should do something about climate change. Now I see young people saying, I'm going to build my career in climate change. I was just speaking to Malini before. And I mean, it's, this is an amazing thing. I think with nature, we still have this kind of old school, slightly Victorian conservation ethos of, oh, if, if we just kick the humans off and fence it, nature will be fine. And I, I think we need to move on from that. And moving on to the, the human dimension, you know, that ultimate species that's changing everything, Gaia. Um, in Nomad Century, you're, you, you've got this um, huge vision of maybe three and a half billion of the Earth's nine billion inhabitants on the move as this band around the equator gets less and less habitable. Um, where are we? I mean, it's happening now, isn't it? And to what extent is it happening right now? Yeah, so... Migration is a, is a completely natural response, and it, which is going on in nature all the time. If you look at um, the most mobile species, if you look at fish, if you look at birds, insects, even plants, even if you look at the tree line, right? Trees which are sort of fixed, you think of them as always in one place. They are migrating. Everything is migrating north. Um, the, the species that will go extinct because of climate change are the ones where we have, we have stopped that migration, either through habitat destruction, um, you know, fragmentation, we've built roads, infrastructure, or because, you know, there is, a, there is a, an, an actual earth system problem in the way, like a coastline or a, a mountain or something. Now, humans have always used that also in their, you know, in our 200,000 year history um, to escape all sorts of natural disasters. But again, that's what we're doing. We're putting artificial borders in their way. We're putting, not, not the earth system borders, we are putting um, our invented political borders in the way. And if you look at the, um, if you look at the climate models, you see over the coming decades, a, an increasing band of unlivability around the tropical regions, around coastlines, um, river deltas, many of our most populous cities. And these are home to a large proportion of the world's population. And it's, it's a really worrying thing 
And I think what we should do, and that's really what my book's about, is we should facilitate, we should help that, um, that global dispersal. Because what's, what's happening is uh, the, human, the human climate niche. So, so unlike other animals, we don't have a particular ecological niche because we're so, so adaptive. We, we adapt our climate. We are disper- we're, the, we're the tropical African ape that is now dispersed from you know, uh, Antarctica to the Arctic, across um, every kind of ecology, even in space, you know, the ISS. But nevertheless, um, we and our agriculture do have a particular habitable niche, and that is shrinking and moving north. And so we need to do that. And I, I have seen on my journeys around the world, everywhere, this, the beginnings of this climate migration. Your great I mean, it book, is Adventures in the Anthropocene, award-winning book, another one you should buy, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ten percent to you. Um, so, so you know, people are already. Th- this migration is already underway. It is inevitable. Um, it is. It is. It is very much happening to the degree the numbers of people. It's not inevitable. We can make it smaller through adaption. We can adaptation. We can make it smaller through mitigation of the climate um, uh, carbon emissions. And um, there are there are many other ways as well, which which I which I discuss in the book. But nevertheless, there will be millions of people who are going to have to move, potentially billions. Um, this is this is a really big crisis, which is not being talked about honestly by any leaders. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's strikingly absent, actually, from the COP process. And I think that absolutely needs to change. I mean, of course, it affects biodiversity as well. It affects everything because, you know... But what you're saying is quite radical, really, because, you know, we've got political politics, we've got borders, and you really want um, ecological, um, you know, principles to rule more than those political ones. Um, do you think there's any? I mean, you look at the debate about immigration in the UK. Um, yeah, we're we're in a we're in a very toxic zone at the moment um, with populist leaders um, in many places around the world, um, and there there is this nationalism um, that is being propagated by many of these leaders. You know, it it it's absolutely nonsensical. Um, from a biological point of view, if you look at any population genetic studies, we are all incredibly mixed up. You know, there is no, there is, there is no national identity genetically. We're all, we're completely mixed up, and not, not like thousands and thousands of years ago. Very recently, within, within a few generations. So that's a nonsense. But you know, there are real borders, and those borders are set by physics. You know, humans cannot live in large populations at um, above certain temperatures, where in a fire zone, where there is constant drought, where there is constant floods. Um, we cannot live in um, deserts, we cannot live on the ocean. We can live in unlivable places in very small numbers and those places will adapt. Places like you know, Dubai have already adapted to those small populations. But if you look at people living outside of that air conditioned shopping mall where literally everything is brought into them, water, food, all the resources, that's where people are dying of heat stroke. You know, the construction workers are dying of heat stroke, of kidney failure, and everything. You look at a city like Mumbai, home to at least 30 million people, probably more, you know, yes, people will still be living there in 2040, 2060, but not in those numbers. They will be living in highly adapted um, infrastructure, not in the current slum housing where the temperatures are already six to 10 degrees above the city proper. It's just not viable. Those people will have to move. You know, if you don't like the idea of large numbers of people moving um, to your country, then what is your alternative? Because um, I don't want to see my primary school kids conscripted into armies to fight these fleeing refugees. I would much rather that we planned for it. It was organized and, um, and it was made as painless as possible. And we, we were living in denser cities um, that were green, clean, and fair, and full of opportunity. Another element of, of this is kind of economics, and I think one of the fascinating uh, things, Sid, that you're talking about in the book is 
is how you, um, how you value nature. And you've talked about kind of walling it off as one approach. Of course, we had the, the Das Gupta uh, review a couple of years ago that really talked about um, how we'd have to have a fundamental change in, in the way that we think about nature. Just talk us through um, putting an economic value on what nature does for us. Yeah, so I mean, the, this idea of natural capital, and it, it sounds scary, it's really quite simple. It's just a way of us understanding the value that nature provides to human society. Some of that value is economic, not all of it. There's cultural, spiritual, intrinsic value, incredibly important. But that economic value can be quantified. And that economic value can then be fostered. So what, what we could do when we think of ecosystem services, so things like clean air, pollination, um, you know, shielding us from the heat, in, in cities, which is a really good example of an ecosystem service, we can put dollar values, acknowledge that dollar values are not perfect, but still put them, put dollar values against these services to then understand what's at stake if we lose those things. So just to give you an example, right? So the cost of the Canada wildfires that are raging right now is, so is estimated to be something like $100 billion in health costs. It's about $2,500 for every person affected by these. Now, it's, it's, it's huge, right? And the annual Canadian wildfire budget is a billion dollars. So what we're doing is we know that this is incredibly, even if you cared about nothing else, you just cared about money, which you know, is obviously not the case. You would look at that and go, we should probably invest a bit more in wildfire mitigation, right? And so it just illuminates some of the choices available to us. If you're in a city that's getting hotter by the day, what you could then say is, okay, we probably shouldn't, pour concrete over every inch of the city, we should bring nature back to reduce the, the heat and the heat island effect so people can live here for longer um, and live healthier, happier lives. So the book is full of examples like that. I mean, you alluded to, you know, the spiritual case for nature as well. We've got a kind of biophilia in us. And, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't be happy as a species if we just lived on a kind of concrete plinth. Um, and there seems to be more and more evidence of, of that effect, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, in, in the book, I kind of cite examples of urban parks, you know, where there's tremendous mental health benefits just from access to nature. This isn't, you know, something that people, for a long time, people dismissed this idea and said, oh, surely not. But and there's increasing evidence that this is true. There's increasing evidence that generally access to natural spaces is, is valuable. And there is something quite innate within us that I, I haven't been able to fully explain, but... Any of you who've, been, who've spent time in nature can relate to this feeling, this feeling of peace, this feeling of being uh, at one with something that isn't just you. And I think that, that, is in, that is intrinsic to who we are as human beings, and we should foster that and allow people to experience the benefits of nature as well. Yeah, Guy, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, point? I just wanted to say that what, um, it, what's really interesting about this, um, this idea, so ecosystem services, this idea that we should value nature and so on, I think what it, what it comes down to is that our measure of um, growth and uh, you know, our, our GDP measure is actually extremely, extremely damaging and it's not a true measure. Now, we need economic growth, of course we do, for, um, to alleviate the enormous amounts of poverty we have. But at the moment, this is quite often, um, it, it, the, the, um, the damage, the social and ecological damage that comes with that is not costed in at all. So we need to absolutely change that model and acknowledge that um, we need to decouple economic growth from um, environmental damage, and that, that is possible, um, but it takes care and it takes, um, it takes really prioritizing and, and um, sort of centering climate, environment, and social costs right at the very heart of every um, decision we make, whether it's in production, whether it's in city planning, infrastructure, materials, all of that, um, to, to, to produce a much more stain, sustainable society. We can't do these things as add-ons. I, I just come back on that. I think I, I completely agree. I mean, GDP is mad <laughs> as a measure for human well-being. But I was really surprised to find that even if you put the blinkers on, you know, you say, let's assume GDP is what we're going to use. We only care about dollars and cents. It still makes sense in so many cases even within this kind of narrow framework that we've trapped ourselves in to invest in protecting and restoring nature. Then you start changing the frame and you realize there's so much more we could value. But I mean, part of the argument I make is we can start now with the very flawed tools we have now 
and there are enough places across the world where it's making sense. And part of what we haven't done is create this narrative of it's possible to do this, because the economic case for nature is not necessarily the private profit case for nature. There are lots of public goods, but someone captures those public goods benefits. In the wildfire example, the government of Canada is going to capture the benefits of investing just a little bit more in healthy forest ecosystems. And there's, there's also a... Sorry, did you... No, 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 go. I was, I was just going to say that um, we also need to be very, very careful about some of the solutions um, to climate change and to, um, to biodiversity loss as well when, we, when we're, um, try, you know, just planting um, a monoculture of trees to uh, withdraw carbon from the atmosphere, for example, is, can be extremely damaging. Well, that, that's exactly what I wanted to pick up on, actually. Uh, I mean, the, the late, great James Lovelock, Jim Lovelock, who gave us Gaia theory. I don't know whether your, your name came from, from Jim Lovelock or... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, I, I, I digress. But, but Jim's whole thing was looking at um, the whole Earth as a system, including its living capital and so on. Um, and you've just started talking about the fact that, you know, I came in mentioning the fact we've got two separate COP processes, but it's, it's very possible to envisage, as you were saying, uh, a carbon reduction measure that's actually going to trash biodiversity. And I think, I think you've both... I mean, you've certainly talked about it in, in your book, and it'll be interesting just to hear how you, how you join the dots, you get a more holistic, I hate that word, but that's, I'm going to use it anyway, to, to, you know, to, to get into the right place. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so I mean, the, these are systemic problems, and they're complex, and they're all interwoven, as we sort of acknowledged right at the very beginning. And so um, a solution to one, it becomes a solution to another. It's a win-win. But at the same time, there are plenty of times where you pull that network too much in one direction, you are having unintended consequences elsewhere. So um, I think we are growing in awareness, but the, because this represents, and it genuinely represents such an amazing um, uh, you know, economic industry, fighting climate change, improving biodiversity, restoring the planet. These are, these are brilliant, and they, they are brilliant um, for new economies, new jobs, new growth, all of that. It means that there is um, a massive danger that um, due care is not taken and, um, and, that, and that people rush to one thing. I don't know whether it's huge amounts of seaweed farming that then, um, that then destroy a, a, a really important intact ecosystem or whatever it is. And, <laughs> you know, I'm not saying we shouldn't act. Of course we should act and we should act very fast, but we need to be... Um, we need to. We need to. I guess we need to. We need to have a process where things are, uh, things are reconsidered. You know, monitored and reconsidered um, uh, uh, periodic things because we don't know a lot of this. You know, we we are a little bit fighting in the dark. And I think in the case for nature, you've got a couple of examples, haven't you, in India and Indonesia, of where there's a tension between trying to do these two things. You know. Yeah, I mean, the so trees are not just standing sticks of carbon. Right, like it, it seems obvious, but it's worth restating because lots of people in the climate movement see nature as one lever to pull alongside grid decarbonization, solar energy, you know, sustainable aviation fuel. It's kind of just one button you press and the climate gets a bit, less, a bit more livable. Nature is much more than that. And I think you know, what I highlight is you know, the part of what we've done as we try and tackle climate change, in most cases, actually, it's possible. You know, some people play up the trade-offs. They say oh, you know, grid transmission is killing species. In most places, it should be possible to resolve those trade-offs honestly and openly. So I should emphasize it's possible. But what we have right now is these two very separate conversations where, like I said at the beginning, conservation is, you know, the stuff of NGOs and government budgets. And the economy is all about decarbonization. And part of why, part of the reason I focused on nature for the book is I think we need to start putting the biodiversity crisis and the links to the climate crisis, but really for its own sake, the biodiversity crisis, at the heart of government decision making, generally corporate decision making, and then kind of how we spend our time and our energy as well. And I just, sorry, one, no, no, one go last far thing away, is that these, these uh, natural ecosystems are largely not these kind of untapped resources. People are living there yeah. and depending on that. and. Um, there are many programs where, where people who have lived there for ages, have the, the, their land is basically being stolen from them by these big projects and they're being turfed off. Um, 
and there's some really quite shocking human rights abuses, whereas actually all the evidence shows that they are the best custodians of these ecosystems. They've been living alongside them and protecting them and understanding them for, you know, millennia sometimes. So the social, the social aspect also has to be, you know, really embedded in all of this. We started talking a bit about the solutions, and actually, in um, the last 10 minutes of our chat, I'd like to, to drill into that. But I just want to uh, encourage you all to think of fiendish questions to put to Sid and Gaia in the last 15 minutes or so. Um, so, Sid, the importance of sustainable ecotourism, regenerative ag agriculture, and I think you talk about work in the UK. Um, tell us a little bit about the sorts of things we, we can do um, through nature to help human societies to adapt? I mean, the one thing, let's start with the food system. I mean, we cannot go on like this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the world's soils are being depleted at this incredible rate. What we have done, which no one thought was possible, is feed 8 billion people on this planet. We produce more than enough calories to feed everyone. We don't get it around efficiently, but we produce enough calories. But we've done that at the cost of natural capital, uh, the cost of the stock of soil health, that produces this kind of productive output that is an ecosystem service. And what I talk about in the book is ways of farming, of producing food that can restore nature in the soil around working farms, you know, producing healthy food for people, higher incomes for farmers, and at the end of the day, kind of preserving natural capital for its own sake so we can continue feeding this many people. And people often go, no, but industrial agriculture has done a great job. It has up to this point, but all the signs are we can't keep going on like this. Similarly, uh, I talk of, I mean, there's a few examples of the book of uh, biodiversity for its own sake, biodiversity markets, biodiversity offset markets. What we've done is where development comes into conflict with biodiversity, there are these governments have done a reasonably good job in some place of saying you have to compensate for the harm you do. But you know, part of what I argue is we can go much further than just compensating for the bad. We can actively begin restoring ecosystems if we can get someone who benefits from that to pay for it. So there's a case in there about a, a, a non-profit in California called Blue Forest. And what they do is pay, they take money from investors, restore forests. So what that means is take dead wood off the forest floor so it doesn't burn. The ecosystems are healthier, but it also burns less frequently. And so the water companies that are downstream of that forest benefit, right? They pay less in uh, cleanup costs. And so effectively what they've done is use some of the tools of finance to structure something that can restore nature. Similarly, there's examples of technology that are making it possible to measure and monitor ecosystems with amazing precision in a way that wouldn't have been possible uh, even a decade ago. So there's lots going on. I think the main message is there's so much going on. We don't hear about it nearly enough. What we do hear about is the doom and gloom stuff of, oh, we're, we're really in a mess. And we are, but there are people working on solutions. In fact, in the, uh, the museum, we're working on a future food gallery idea. And I think one of the, the kind of top line messages is how on earth are we going to feed 10 billion people by 2050 without ruining the planet in the process? And Guy, you, you look at reforming food production. And I suppose reform doesn't just mean making it more efficiently. But I think one of the shocking things is I seem to remember we waste something like a third of the food that we produce. It's kind of horrifying. There's plenty of food to feed everybody if we could just think of new ways to distribute it. So Guy, just talk us a little bit through, through that. Yeah, so we waste um, about a third of the food. So in the, in, uh, the rich world, we waste um, a third of the food sort of post, um, you know, the, in consumption, throwing it away, um, getting too much in, in stores and so on. In the poor world, it's wasted from, uh, from field to actual consumers. Um, because of very simple things like not enough, um, not enough uh, storage um, for for grains in in poor countries that are kept at the right temperatures, bad roads that mean food rots from one end of the country to the other, all sorts of things that are eminently solvable. But you know what we need is an absolute transformation in our food system. It's not just small things it is also so are we all going to be things. eating insects in a few <laughs> years time we are going to be eating uh, i think our main found protein will be um insects because they're much more sustainable um hang on let's let's be... get an audience vote everyone happy eating insects put your hands up if you are 
Oh, there pretty, go. pretty there good. Go. That's great. Let's let's get Delicious the locusts Delicious when deep fried crickets. <laughs> mm, yummy, yummy. No, but I mean, um, at the moment, what we're doing is we we have this incredibly inefficient way of getting um, our protein where we where we chop down um, ecosystems to grow the crops to feed to animals which we then slaughter to feed ourselves. And that whole process means we lose, you know, most of the value of it uh, down the food chain. It's much, much better to um, eat it at source. And so I'm not saying we will all become vegan, um, but, we, but, um, but meat and dairy and fish will be a much smaller part of our, of our diets, right? We, they need to be... You know, we need to eat more plants. We've also got a huge um, health crisis around the world, an obesity crisis, which is directly linked to what we're eating. Um, we need to eat more plants. Um, but the climate crisis alone is, um, is restricting where and what crops we can grow. So we can no longer rely on these huge food baskets. I mean, what's going on? What, what's, what's, um, what's just happened in Ukraine, for example, with this, um, that's conflict-based, but that's um, a huge hit to the food, you know, that, the destruction of those crops because of the dam burst is a huge hit. You look at places um, uh, in East Africa, they've, they've suffered, um, you know, year upon year, multiple droughts, which wear down the resilience of the people, but also it means that the agricultural production is tiny there now. Um, but we're seeing that absolutely everywhere, from um, from India to Italy, right? Um, it's 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 a real problem. We're going to have to change where we grow our crops, what crops we grow, how we grow them, and that's putting huge pressure on a yep. population that is growing um, over the coming decades. And it means fundamental reform to to what we do. I mean, it's so so the the the, um, the meat and dairy industry generally is bad for biodiversity. Um, it's bad for our health, and it's also a major contributor to um, carbon emissions, to the climate crisis. So it needs reform. But, you know, it, we don't need to panic. We have so many solutions um, to yeah. this, you know, whether it's artificial meats, whether it's the new lab-grown things, whether it's, um, whether it's actually, Spots. you know, there are, there are many delicious cuisines around the world where they eat minimal meat anyway. India is one, Italy, Persian food, you know, um, we can have incredibly varied, delicious diets, and we are making that transition already. You go into the smallest coffee shop, and there will be soy milk, nut milk, pea milk, you know, oat milk, uh, you know. So, so we are making that transition. Just to wind up this, uh, if there was a kind of, um, uh, you know, one area that we should focus on, you think it's, it's food production would be the one kind of interaction between humans and nature, that if we could get that right that would make a big difference to biodiversity and all the rest of it i, th I think food i mean that includes fishing which is this in, yeah in, what well, it's just completely crazy that we effectively hunt fish in the wild on mass we take out hundreds of millions of tons of fish out of the sea every year we don't do that to any other wild population of anything and when we do we consider it bushmeat that you know we've kind of passed the rubicon of saying we shouldn't be getting bushmeat from the forest but we do it from the sea in completely yeah. unsustainable numbers. So I think, yes, the food system is the biggest lever. Something like 90% of all deforestation is in some way linked to animal agriculture. So that would immediately cut the legs out, out under deforestation and make a huge difference. And I do think you know, what we shouldn't forget is it isn't just about the food system and how it puts pressure on natural ecosystems. Most, I mean, in this country, 70% of land is agricultural land. The reason it's a desert is we farmed it in a way that makes it an ecological desert. We can farm it in a completely different way that provides habitat for some of the birds, plants, animals, all the things that, that used to live here. Yeah. Right? So yeah, we talked about the 30 by 30. I mean, in this country, we are so yeah. far off meeting <laughs> that target. And yet we're a rich country with all the capacity, all the expertise, all the knowledge, all the ability to do it. It's just, yeah, we need, we need the political will. So let's... Um, Start off on getting some audience questions here. Where's that? Where's our microphone person to see if I can? Uh, aha! Right, I've got a question right here in the front. Fire away. Um, do I have permission to briefly mention a very important book that's highly relevant? Before I ask my question about nature and the. It, it sounds like you're desperate to mention it, so mention away. Um, it's a book by Professor Bill Gamage of Australian National University. Mm -hmm. It won the Prime Minister Book Prize. And it is an extraordinary exploration 
of the Australian Aborigines and how they lived in harmony with nature, yeah. there are many lessons, including for wildfire, right. wildfires. So just a very strong recommendation. My question, if I may, is about nature and the coronavirus pandemic. Where, what lessons can we learn? How can we move forward? And a particular point I feel is important is the immune system. As it's the seat of, uh, as our first line of defense against illness, and I feel we should be looking at how we can harness strengthening the immune system, working within the laws of nature to move forward, and I'd be very interested in your comments, please. It's a great recommendation. <laughs> yeah, Gamage is actually in the book, and it's a, one of the case studies is actually about um, how indigenous peoples in Australia managed ecosystems with human-created fire, so you never got the massive wildfires that you get today. You, get, you got small local wildfires that created this patchwork of habitats for animals to thrive. On the pandemic point, I, I, I'm sometimes slightly uncomfortable making the direct link between a specific pandemic and a specific mm. uh, you know, spillover incident. Similarly, you know, climate scientists will be very uncomfortable saying today was hot because of climate change. It's all statistical. But I think you're right. I mean, our bodies, our ecosystems, you know, preserving that balance is a good thing. I'm not an expert, but maybe you are, Gaia. <laughs> yeah, so they are directly linked. I will go and say that. <laughs> Um, as we um, as we enter new um, ecosystems, so so that almost certainly started with um, karst caves in Laos um, and northern, so the border of Laos and China, um, where they have these big caves um, uh, where a lot of bats live. And bats are really, really they are the most incredible creature. They can have all these viruses and just never get sick, and they live for a long time and scientists are trying to work out how they don't get cancers and don't get all these different diseases. Um, and the communities that live around there have um, some immunity to some of these, um, some of these pathogens. But, you know, they can, uh, they can live with, you know, they can, they can pass from, um, from the animal to the human and then they can, um, the, the, uh, the pathogen can genetically develop within that community to become much more spreadable and when we start taking you know inter interrupting the um the wild ecosystem and bringing it into our domestic and city environments where we have this huge um density and concentration of people all living closely together it's the perfect environment for disease spread and we've seen that in you know, on the edges of rainforests, when they're um, invaded in various countries, we see the um, most of the most of the disease-carrying organisms we have originated. They're zoonotic. They originated um, in animals. So um, it's another reason why we should why we should respect natural ecosystems and be very careful. And in, just in terms of climate change, we actually have climate attribution scientists now who are very able to directly say the likelihood of a specific heat wave being um, attributed to climate change, um, which is brilliant, um, brilliant for, um, especially as there is, there is still a massive community in the United States, for example, where of climate deniers, but. Um, Sorry, just to I mean, clarify, I, I'm not a climate denier. No, no, I know, I know. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I think Guy's exactly right. It's about the likelihood of events. And so, for example, the current, this is, this, the. Global mean temperature anomaly this month is off the charts. Yeah. There's something like a 0.0001% chance that this would have happened in the absence of climate change. So it's a very, very good, you know, it's a, yeah. you, can, you can then make attribution like claims around it. But. And in fact, thinking of uh, the last time I interviewed James Lovelock, you know, father of Gaia, not that Gaia, um, he took a Gaian view of the pandemic. It was actually during um, the end of one of the lockdowns that. Um, the pandemic was kind of Gaia's reaction to the, you know, not my reaction, just human clarifying. population. <laughs> okay, let's before I confuse everyone with, with these various Gaias, um, we've got a question down here. Uh, thank you very much, as gentlemen here. Is it on? Yep. Um, I just like to say, I mean, it's great. I agree with all this stuff, but I'm still fairly petrified with the monetization of disasters. I mean, I've been involved in the past in this whole carbon offset thing. I won't go into that now, but we all know where, where a lot of that's gone. Frank Upan this morning reminded us of something. With climate change, climates are moving north. The whole of Siberia apparently is very likely, quite soon, to be a good agricultural source. With that government there, are they going to use it 
to help the rest of the world? No, they're going to see what a wonderful opportunity to exploit climate, climate change, biodiversity, everything, so we can sell our wheat to the world from Russia. So I'm worried about governments, because governments are going to intervene. How many governments are going to see these as opportunities for enhancement rather than something for the good of nature as a whole? Who is going to intervene on our behalf? That's all. Sid, do you want to pick that up? It's evils of capitalism. So, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, I, I really, I struggle with this in the book because I think, you know, on one hand, you, you work with a system we have today, and it's a system that has produced remarkable economic gains, but has dramatically drawn down our natural capital. And given the system we have, part of the point I make is it's still possible to make big leaps in the way we treat nature. <laughs> Uh, the other piece I, I do want to just mention is, you know, we do currently value nature in economic terms. We just value nature in extractive economic terms. So every forest that's being cut down, there's value to those logs. Someone is saying that's worth more dead than alive, and they're cutting it down. So it is a question of incentives. And what I was struck by is, you know, on, on the margins, on the frontiers of deforestation, for example, the marginal gain is pretty small. And so it comes back to climate justice. You know, we shouldn't blame the people on the front lines in every case for what they do to survive, but someone needs to be willing to put up the money, I think, so people on those front lines can live um, within an economic system that we've created. So I, I kind of feel like we have to find a way of um, making it worth their while. Right. Let, let's take a couple more questions. Got what, gentlemen in the front here and gentlemen uh, over there. I hope I'm not, I haven't looked enough that way, so I hope I'm not neglecting someone on that side. Fire away. Um, I think most people are familiar with the concept of greenwashing, which is basically where a token financial contribution is made towards cleaning up an environment. I'm just wondering what the um, speakers think about greenwashing being taken to the next step, which is actually corporate um, world being mandated to make a far greater contribution, um, almost like a taxation. Um, now that we acknowledge that governments are not really capable of coming because of demo democratic process with um, the commitment required. Sid, with, with your FT and McKinsey background, I think you're <laughs> the right person to answer this I, one. I think <laughs> pricing the externality of either carbon pollution or biodiversity loss is a useful thing. I think all of these voluntary markets are tiny and without government regulation they're never going to scale. So. I mean, if we want to do this right, governments will have to step in. There are no markets in the world that function at scale that do not involve significant government regulation. Like, imagine using your credit card without the kind of fraud regulation that sits around it to make you confident and make the seller confident that the transaction is going to work out. We need to do the same for all of these markets. And so I think I completely agree with you. You know, we need governments to be setting rules, setting them transparently and with the right safeguards in place. But without that, none of this is going to scale. Gar, do you want to come in, or shall I take another question? Yeah, I was just going to say that this is not this. This has to be beyond um, national governments. Um, we, this needs to be global, and we've we've really um, let things slide a lot over the last few decades in terms of um, you know deregulated markets all over the shop, and that's one of the reasons we're in this mess. Um, and but that does have huge power because first of all it gives a lot more certainty to where and, and guides that investment without even incentivizing you know it just completely guides what is what is possible and then the markets can respond um but but absolutely you know it, it, it needs to be uh, it needs to be um globally agreed and yeah we need another cop for that <laughs> let's have i think probably just one last question actually uh, over here um yeah um when the the COVID crisis hit, is finally when everybody came together, effectively scientific community-wise, to create a solution, and they also realized the poor, those who were left out had to be looked after as well, as was affected. Are we reach a, have we reached a point in this whole climate crisis with 1.5 degrees being kind of a pipe dream and all that, that really requires really a scientific breakthrough? I mean, no amount of switching of lights in the night is going to solve it. It really is something which requires a whole different kind of response. What do you think, Sid? Are you going to talk about fusion power, perhaps? Is that waiting in the wings? I don't know. I mean, I would say, I, would say I think probably yes. And I think what we're talking about is geoengineering here. Um, I think, so the reason we're in this mess is because um, 
the, the, the heat from the sun hits the surface of the planet um, and the ocean, you know, the land and the ocean. Most of it bounces back to space. But the invisible gases that we're all emitting, these greenhouse gases, what they do is they trap that heat that's bouncing back so it can't, it can't escape into space. And most of it's actually um, being absorbed by the oceans. They're, they're, they're taking up most of that heat. But that energy, that extra energy, is what is driving these much more intense heat waves, of course, but storms and these um, taking things that were once in a century, once in a millennia, um, uh, to, to these much more back-to-back -back frequent events. And instead of them being discrete, you know, occurring, you know, one little event on the, you know, in Orissa and another little event in, um, you know, Emilia Romana and it, whatever, you know, they're going to start becoming um, across the nation and regional. Um, and that wears down resilience. So um, there are technologies um, that, uh, that could, uh, could reflect back that sun's heat as it comes down before it even gets a chance to hit the earth and be trapped. Um, and I'm, I think very much that these are going to start being deployed within a few decades. And I think it's time that we had honest conversations about them and put in place, um, you know, uh, and, and talked about, you know, under what circumstances would people be uh, willing to use them or would they not use them? We need democratic decisions about them. We need honesty about trade-offs. How would um, com countries or populations be compensated for negative effects? What would the regulatory procedure be? Um, under what circumstances would they be used? Where might they be used? How and what's, um, you know, we're not having any of these discussions. And the alternative, I think, is that, um, you know, these are deployed under an emergency scenario as, as lockdowns were deployed under an emergency scenario in nations. And that was fine because it was an acute emergency to stop the spread of um, a disease. Yeah. This would be long term. Um, and I don't want to see that happen. I think we need to have discussions about it. I think it, you know, I think there are a lot of benefits to it, but we need to discuss it and democratically decide, and we're not doing that. Well, there was a fascinating paper out a couple of weeks ago showing that actually um, warming was more intense um, during the lockdowns, and the reason was that um, there was less particulate pollution, which reflects light back into space. So that experiment, as, as it were, has already given us a glimpse of the power of geoengineering, if we got it exactly. right. Exactly. And because we're cleaning up our heavy industry, so, the, so the, the particles that would be emitted high into the stratosphere would be um, most likely sulfates. Um, and these are emitted generally in pollution in these heavy industries. But as countries start cleaning up these, you know, China, for example, has massively cleaned up and shipping will start cleaning up this. We are, we are losing that reflective um, potential, but that, I mean that is really great because they're terrible for health in the lower atmosphere. Really, really shocking, and they also exacerbate warming in other places because they get dispersed into pristine uh, glaciers, Arctic, and so on. But just to just to explain how this might work, the proportion of sulfates that we would put into the stratosphere to have that effect would be an absolute. Um, fraction of what is emitted in today's industrial pollution that is so hazardous for health. So, yeah, it's definitely something we need to we need to discuss openly, honestly, um, and you know what the trade-offs are if we use it, and what the trade-offs are if we don't use it. Right? Sid, do you want to come in for one yeah. one last comment? I mean, the stuff. I mean, the reason it scares me, but this is why I agree with Gaia. We should have the debate honestly. And the reason it scares me, they think it's so poorly understood. Um, particularly the effects that this could have on weather patterns like the Indian monsoon, unclear. The local effects of some places might benefit, but others might be worse off. Um, I think there's, you know, what we, they call it solar radiation management. What it doesn't address is ocean acidification, for example, which would continue unabated even if you reflect some of the sunlight. So there are real downsides, but I think we could get to that point where this is a real emergency and this is on balance the better thing to do, but I'd rather have that debate openly and honestly uh, well before we have to use it, <laughs> if we guess that point. Well, look, there, alas, we'll have to bring the proceedings to a close. I'm just going to, uh, before I hand over to uh, our JLF um, uh, to give one last comment, I just want to say what a brilliant discussion it's been, what excellent questions you had. Please give Sid and Guy a warm hand of applause. Thank you.